This week on Sneak Previews, our annual Rising Stars show, where we look at some of the hottest young performers in the movie business. Now, you may not recognize their faces right now, but these are six actors whose dramatic ability and sheer charisma will make them an important part of Hollywood's future. Every year on Sneak Previews, we devote one special show to picking Hollywood's rising stars. And at the end of this year's show, we're going to go look back at some of the talented young actors we've selected in the past. Now, some of them have gone on to spectacular fame, and some, well, we'll admit it, they've faded into total obscurity. But first, we're absolutely confident that there are no duds at all in this year's batch. Six of the hottest, most talented, can't-miss performers in the business. I'm Michael Medved. And I'm Jeffrey Lyons, and our first star is one whom you probably have already seen in a few popular movies. A young New Jersey-born actor, already a heartthrob among his growing number of female fans. Robert Sean Leonard began acting in summer stock stage productions when he was just 11. So far, he's best known as the troubled student at a boys' boarding school in Dead Poets Society, who here has come to his teacher, Robin Williams, to discuss a serious problem. What's up? I just talked to my father. He's making me quit the play at Henley Hall. <laughs> Acting is everything to me. I... But he doesn't know. He... No, I can see his point. We're not a rich family like Charlie's. We... But he's planning the rest of my life for me, and I... he's never asked me what I want. But beyond charisma, it's the mark of a good young actor if he can acquit himself in a movie which didn't fare well. As with Swing Kids, about some rebellious German youths who defy the Nazis by jitterbugging to verboten American jazz music. How do I look? Like gold. Thickest time in sport, I pray thee, tell me truly how thou likest her. Or would you buy her? But his best role so far is as the young Count Claudio in Much Ado About Nothing, director and co-star Kenneth Branagh's luminous version of Shakespeare's romantic tale. Here, just back from the wars, Claudio's thoughts have turned to love for the beautiful maiden hero. In mine eyes, she's the sweetest lady that ever I looked on. I can see yet without spectacles, and I see no such matter. There's her cousin, and she were not possessed with a fury. Exceeds her as much in beauty as the first of May doth the last of December. But I hope you have no intent to turn husband. Have you? I would scarce trust myself, though I had sworn the contrary. If Hero would be my wife. Ist come to this, shall I never see a bachelor of three score again? Of course, we both loved Much Ado About Nothing and picked it as one of the year's best films. And I think you've got to acknowledge that Robert Sean Leonard made a very surprising, very strong contribution here. Not everybody can do Shakespeare and look so natural, so vulnerable, sort of romantic and fresh. But he does it, and he does something else amazing, which is holding his own on screen against Kenneth Branagh, one of the most formidable, intense, and interesting actors around. Well, the fact is, most people can't do Shakespeare, even badly. He does it very well. He has a sincerity about him above all else. He's a classy-looking guy, but you don't just show up on the set of a Shakespeare movie able to hold your own against experienced actors. You have to have experience. I've seen him act on stage, doing everything from Shaw to Neil Simon. He's very good in ensemble acting, and never better than in Much Ado About Nothing. Well, you talk a little bit about the sincerity, that aura that he carries with him. A lot of people said he reminds them of a young Henry Fonda, and I think he has that quality. He's a lanky, sort of Lincoln-esque, uh, uh, tall, stuff, right? straight-shooting guy. And even in uh, Swing Kids, which wasn't a good movie, where his 
character has a little bit more of a dark side to it. Every move, you're riveted on him, and you're right there with the character. Well, you talk about holding your own. In his most recent film, Age of Innocence, the Martin Scorsese-directed epic, sort of, he holds his own against Daniel Day-Lewis, who plays his father. Leonard turns up very late in the movie, and he's kind of a, a bolt of energy, which almost woke me up. It's a beautiful but very slow-moving picture, and he's fine used exactly as he was very late in the film. Absolutely, even though there's very little age difference in real life between Daniel Day-Lewis and Robert Sean Leonard. He also got to play Paul Newman's son in Mr. and Mrs. Bridge, where he's very good, a film more people should see. Well, moving on, we look at Julianne Moore, whose young career already demonstrates some amazing versatility of her own. Now, she has a performing arts degree from Boston University, and she's done Shakespeare and Chekhov on stage, but she's also won a daytime Emmy for her part in your favorite soap opera, Jeffrey, <laughs> As the World Turns. But what's brought her to the edge of stardom is her attention-getting, supporting roles in a few big feature films, even though one of those few big features turned out to be an embarrassing bomb. Part of the trouble with Body of Evidence is that nobody could believe that lawyer Willem Dafoe would actually prefer Madonna, his kinky client, to his passionate wife, Julianne Moore. What did she do to you, Frank? How did you get those marks on your chest? What, what are they? What are they? Bites? What happened to your back? I thought we were happy. Moore also played a small role in The Fugitive as a doctor in a busy hospital who recognizes there's something wrong when Harrison Ford, as a wanted man, Dr. Richard Kimball, disguises himself as a janitor and then tries to help save a suffering patient. Hey, you have a particular interest in our patient's x-rays? What do you mean? I saw you looking at that boy's chest film. <laughs> it's a hobby of mine. It's a hobby, really? Yeah. What are your other hobbies? Brain surgery? What do you want? I want to know how that boy ended up in surgery. Look, I'm a janitor. I do what I'm told. Who changed those orders? I don't know what you mean. In Robert Altman's shortcuts, Moore sparkled in the midst of an all-star cast, playing a slightly flaky and flirtatious artist who arouses the jealous concern of her husband, Matthew Modine. That wonderful marrying how we can skate around an issue. Always playing our little game. That's a good idea. A game. Might help break the ice. Jeopardy, maybe. I'm talking about us. I'm talking about now. What about us? Please. You never, ever let an attractive woman take a power position in your home. It's very bad business. <laughs> Here, Moore warns her best friend, Annabella Sciorra, about the dangers of taking Rebecca de Mornay into her home as a nanny. There was also a danger for all the other performers in Hand That Rocks the Cradle and playing alongside Julianne Moore, since she easily upstaged every one of them as a sexy businesswoman. All I'm saying is you have to watch your back. I'm serious. There's too much pressure. Look, these days when we feel like a failure, she doesn't bring in $50,000 a year and still make time for sex. I don't know, maybe not yet. <laughs> Marlene's not much of a cook. <laughs> Marlene, I think I'm going to bum one of these. You're such a bad influence. He only smokes around you now. <laughs> one isn't going to kill me. Oh, wait, I got it. The hand that rocks the cradle is the hand that rules the world. Well, I didn't care much for The Hand That Rocks the Cradle. I thought it was a silly, annoying, contrived movie. But she fits the litmus test of, an, of a rising star. I hated to see her character, shall we say, leave the movie, for anybody who cares to see it on video now. When she left, when she disappeared, I felt a genuine sense of loss because there was nobody else in the movie I cared a hoot about. Well, it sort of takes that special edge off the movie, and that edge is exactly what Julianne Moore brings to all of her roles, not only when she's playing sort of a sexy, sophisticated as she does in both shortcuts and Hand That Rocks the Cradle, so memorable but also in a, a, what I considered a silly little movie, Benny and June, where she has a small part as uh, Aidan Quinn's love interest. She's playing sort of an unassuming, lonely, simple, down-home girl, but she is absolutely riveting to watch and becomes sort of a center of the movie while she's on screen. Did you share my reaction, meanwhile, watching her in The Fugitive? When that scene happened, I saw she brought a life to the character beyond it being a small part. 
and I hoped for a minute that they would interrupt the furious pace of the movie and go into her life. Of course, they didn't, but I kind of wish they did for a minute. Well, I, I, think, I think everybody would have that same reaction. She's so strong on screen, you almost want there to be a love interest with Harrison Ford, even though there's not. She has the whole world open to her now, especially since Shortcuts, where you see actually quite a bit of Julianne Moore and one of the more attention-getting scenes in a very long and complicated movie. And Willem Dafoe was crazy to leave her for Madonna. <laughs> well, our next rising star is Brendan Fraser. He was born in Indianapolis, raised in Europe and Canada, and studied at the Actors Conservatory in Seattle, where he did the classic plays before debuting in the movie Dogfight. But it was as Encino Man that Brendan Fraser really cleaned up. He plays a caveman, thought out by two valley dudes who remove centuries of dirt, then dress him in cool clothes and plan to take him to school. A dumb idea for a movie, sure, but young audiences loved it. Okay. But Fraser showed he could handle a powerful and dramatic role as well, as in his next movie, oh, School on, Ties, set at a posh New England boarding school on, in 1955. As a star quarterback transfer student on scholarship who happens to be Jewish, he's just faced the ugly syndrome of anti-Semitism, which he fights with anger and bitterness. You know, the first day I came to this place, I thought I was dreaming. I knew it was only going to be for a year, but I thought, man, what a year. I get into Harvard. And it's not all that easy when you come from Podunk Public High School. You guys were my friends. We were winning games. I met Sally. I didn't want anything to mess it up. I didn't want to be told that I couldn't be a part of it because I was a Jew. You know, it's not every young actor who is equally comfortable, equally at home in sort of brainless comedy, Encino Man, and a rather painfully earnest melodrama, which School Ties was. He's wonderful in School Ties. He has a lot of lines to deliver in contrast to the almost silent role he has in Encino Man, and he does every one of them with conviction, earnestness, and real passion. Well, dumb as Encino Man was, there is a bit of a challenge for an actor to be interesting without saying anything but grunting, and he met the challenge. <laughs> I really like School Ties. I picked it as one of the year's best films perhaps in retrospect i may have overrated it just a bit but he was very good in it in that scene that we showed he showed not that he was just a tall strong quarterback but he showed how genuinely hurt and surprised he was to face the ugliness of anti-semitism well he has that gift of making you care about him and i think that was why encino man was so successful is here is a shall we say a rather underwritten part and yet everybody's instinctively oh he's so sweet he was mm -hmm. so sympathetic for him he's a big strong obviously very handsome guy but the kind of person that obviously a lot of young female viewers want to cuddle and one thing I happened to catch by accident was a TV show, his debut called Guilty Until Proven Innocent, playing Martin Sheen's, I think, foster son who was accused of murder or something. He was very good in that, too. So if people want to see this actor, who, after all, has made only two movies, not counting a cameo in Paulie Shore's movie, Son-in-Law, I think you should try to see that, too. He's a rising star Without indeed. Without question. Well, next up is Angela Bassett, one of the most dazzling newcomers in years. She was born in St. Petersburg, Florida, and in high school took a trip to Washington and saw James Earl Jones in Of Mice and Men. Well, no surprise, she decided then and there to become an actress. After winning a scholarship to Yale, then studying at the Yale Drama School and acting on Broadway, she made her screen debut as the working mother in Boys in the Hood. Here, talking to her son's teacher after the boy's been suspended from school. Is there some problem in the home? Are you employed? That's really none of your business. But since you asked, I am employed and I'm studying to receive my master's degree. Then you are educated. Listen, are we going to talk about me or my son? I'm sorry. Uh, well, we'll be happy to see Trey back in class on Tuesday. Uh, his suspension was only for three days, you know. No, I don't think you'll be seeing Trey again. And why is that, may I ask? Because Trey is going to live with his father. His father? Yes, his father. Or did you think we made babies by ourselves? Then she won a pivotal role in Malcolm X, Spike Lee's sprawling biography of the controversial Muslim leader, played by Denzel Washington. She made the most out of playing Betty Shabazz, who would eventually become Malcolm's wife. And here she reveals her innermost feelings and hopes. Brother Malcolm, there are a few things about women that you don't understand. Some of us were quite possessive, very vain. 
find. And persistent when we've set our mind to something. What have you set your mind to? Being a good Muslim, a good nurse, and a good wife. But her biggest part to date came playing Tina Turner in What's Love Got to Do With It, where she did some brilliant lip syncing to newly recorded vocals by the real Tina Turner. Angela Bassett brought such energy, intensity, and conviction to her role and did such a careful job of recreating Tina's trademark moves that audiences forgot all about the fact that she bore little physical resemblance to the genuine rock superstar. Angela Bassett was good in that movie, not only in the musical numbers, but she played so well against Lawrence Fishburne in his magnificent performance. She is a wonderful actress. I think there's only one thing she could never play, which is a character who isn't smart, because she brings that very special aura of intelligence and thinking and listening to every one of her roles. She is terrific. Good observation. And for her, the challenge in playing Tina Turner in a role which I wish more people had seen, because she, I think she might have gotten an Oscar nomination out of it, mm -hmm. was that not only do you have to try to evoke the, the character of Tina Turner, Turner, but you have to move in a special way that only Tina Turner can do. She pumped up for some reason, which was almost distracting because she looks so unbelievably strong in the movie, but she did master the roles. In fact, the Proud Mary number took her 17 hours to film. It was such a demanding role. Well, she is a very careful actress. She prepares very carefully. Her life's journey from a housing project in St. Petersburg, which is where she grew up, to a scholarship to Yale and then on to Yale Drama School is an amazing story all its own. Right, yeah, right, absolutely. absolutely. But, you know, I'll tell you one thing that it, it, it really says something that here you have this very gifted young black actress and I think it's a shame that a lot of the most prestigious roles are going to singers with no acting experience people like Janet, Janet Jackson, Jackson and Whitney right. Houston I think Angela Bassett has to have an opening and has to have the opportunity to become the star she deserves to be well David Duchovny is our next rising star and he's already appeared in eight major films since making his 1990 debut in Henry Jaglum's New Year's Day in nearly all of his films this former English literature grad student at Yale has been cast as a slick sexy seductive character who women find irresistible in the intriguing independent film Julia Has Two Lovers, Duchovny plays an operator who's so smooth that he's even able to make the most of a fateful wrong number. You want to know why I'm calling? Really? Yeah. My wife just left me. Oh, Justin, I'm sorry. Justin? This is Daniel. Daniel? Daniel. I don't know any Daniel. Is this Valerie? No, this is Julie. I think you have the wrong number. No, no, wait, wait. It's no, your no, birthday? No, it's not my birthday either. It's not your birthday. Who's Jack? This is funny. He's calling the wrong number. And he's about Duchovny to took time out for family comedy with his prize mega hit, Beethoven, where he plays an obnoxious yuppie who's trying to take advantage of Charles Grodin in a one-sided business deal. But the family St. Bernard has other ideas. I pitched in college. What are you doing? Well, I sat down with your photos, which are wonderful, by the way. Thank you. And my tapes, and I started writing. How's it going? It's the best stuff I've ever done. And I David Duchovny got both ears pierced for California, his biggest movie role to date, where he plays a grad student who eventually gets a bloody lesson in reality from Brad Pitt. But here, he tells his photographer girlfriend, Michelle Forbes, about progress on a project about serial killers. I think we got a book here with your pictures and my writing. It's a book. A book on the warehouse murder? No, no, no. Okay. A book on some of the most infamous murders in American history. I want to go to where they lived, 
and where they killed, and I want you to take the pictures, and I'm going to write the text. Well, one critic wrote that he comes from, quote, the same gene pool, I think he put it, as Alec Baldwin and Richard Gere. He's suave, and yet he's also believable. He has a down-to-earth quality, so he's not just a typical Hollywood pretty face. Not at all, because he also projects that quality of intelligence that we were talking about before. He has been in a lot of movies. I think some people may remember him from The Rapture with Mimi Rogers, right. where he, he plays somebody who sort of likes to participate in group sex. I think what he needs in his career right now is to get away a little little bit from the sort of the dark, understated, strange, independent movies. And Beethoven, for instance, was a, a good career move for him, showing that he can appear and, and be very comfortable in something completely different. He also was the cross-dressing detective in Twin Peaks, which had <laughs> a huge cult audience for a while, and played Officer J.D. Tippett in Ruby, a picture I thought I rather like, not a lot of people saw it, but now it's important for him to get the right role, which will match all of his rave reviews, and give him another starring performance. Well, I think without question. He was also in Chaplin, remember? He played Chaplin's cameraman. Almost no lines he's been, he's been yeah. turned up everywhere, which is a sign that casting directors like him, like his look, which I think does remind a lot of people about Richard Gere. But the fact is that I think that if you look at Richard Gere's early movies, Duchovny has an even greater range and more conviction. Well, our final rising star is Susie Amos, and this is a former fashion model from Oklahoma City who's been working in movies for a surprisingly long time. In fact, for nine years now, since she made her debut in the forgettable coming-of-age film Fandango. Remember that one? Alongside another then-unknown performer named Kevin Costner. Ever since Fandango, Amos has always been a riveting screen presence, but it's only the last few years she's shown the versatility that'll make her a star. Rocket Gibraltar was a tearjerker that Jeff loved, but I hated, with Amos as a sexy, free-spirited daughter who comes home for a family reunion and fascinates men of all ages, including her young nephew. Hi, Kane. Oh, hi, Nagy. How you doing? Okay. She's grown up. Thanks. How was your ride out? It was great. Mom let me drive. Yeah? Yeah. No. Yeah, she did. No. Yeah, it was great. Then it was. Bye. In Watch It, a likable but obscure romantic comedy, she's much more down to earth. She plays Peter Gallagher's love interest, a level-headed veterinarian who's good at absolutely everything she does, including analyzing the Chicago White Sox. I happen to be a, a premier authority on the game of baseball, so if you got any questions, just ask. Who's pitching for the White Sox? Uh, that'd be it's Greg... Jack McDowell. No, no, it's Greg Hibbert. No, I think it's McDowell. <laughs> I'm pretty sure it's Greg Hibbert. The guy warming up down there is right-handed. Greg Hibbert isn't. And he's obviously not on the 15-day disabled list. Greg Hibbert is. It's all right, buddy. You can explain the game to me if you want to. <laughs> Her breakthrough role came in Bruce Beresford's Rich in Love, playing a passionate nonconformist older daughter Hello, who returns home girl. to father Albert Finney with an important hey, announcement. Pop. How you doing? Pop, this is Billy. My husband. Your what? My husband. Billy McQueen. He and I got married on the way down to Myrtle Beach. Married? Married? Yes, sir. Well, marriage is a wonderful institution. In the feminist western The Ballad of Little Joe, Amos got to show new range to her acting ability, playing an Eastern society woman who flees to the frontier and lives for years disguised as a man. The only one who knows her secret is a Chinese laborer she's rescued from lynching and who shares her cabin. How long do you think it would take him to figure out about me? It took you three days. But that is me. Well, then what about us? What do you think would happen if they found out about me? Little Joe Monahan turns out to be a woman and she's lovers with a ailing Chinaman? They'd kill us. <laughs> As you know, Michael, from day one, I've been a very big fan of Susie Amos ever since I first recall her in Rocket Gibraltar as the sexy daughter to Burt Lancaster, a film I absolutely loved. Yes, you were the one. I know, you didn't like it, but you have to admit, she brings a freshness and an energy and a brightness to any role she, she handles. And more important, I think, she dispels the common myth that even though you were a fashion model, you cannot be a good actress. She was a high-priced fashion model and is a good actress. Yes, she certainly is. By the way, there was another fashion model named Jessica Lange who made a pretty good actress, too. Oh, many have. So and, and, and Susie Amos, Susie 
Susie Amos has this quality. Whenever she delivers a line, it's like she's just forming the words. They're just thinking about them. They're fresh out of her mouth. And she had the good fortune also to marry into an acting family. On the set of Fandango, her first movie, she met Sam Robards and married him, still married to him. And he's the son of Jason Robards and a pretty good actress named Lauren Bacall. And a one-time fashion model herself. <laughs> and, you know, the ballad of Little Joe had to win me over, much as I like her, because I had to believe that everybody in the town would believe that this woman, disguised as a man, was indeed a man. And she went about the role perfectly. And dutiful though she is, she had a slender kind of approach to the part and had some masculine movements to and made me believe that they would be fooled. Well, with her voice and everything else, it's one of the best gender bender performances in Hollywood history. The big tragedy is she had to cut off her beautiful mane yeah. of tawny hair to do it. But uh, at this point, I think we might as well begin fessing up <laughs> to some of the choices we've made in the past for rising stars. The sneak previews have been doing this for 12 years, and some of those choices are not exactly household names. I remember years past, you picked someone named Linda Fiorentino <laughs> from a movie called Vision Quest to be a rising star. How about your choice? You know, we don't want to make light of this because these are actors who, who want the work. Jeanette Goldstein, you said, was going straight to the top right, after, after her Aliens, role in Aliens, I think, or, right. You know, it really hasn't happened Well, yet. other people like Jasmine Guy from Harlem Nights. And, right, Anthony Michael Hall after The Breakfast Club. Yeah, Charlotte Lewis, not a household name, after her role in Golden Child. Uh, we picked John Carlo Esposito, who's a wonderful actor. Has a TV series now, but really hasn't made it yet in films. Well, he was in Do the Right Thing. We've also picked Mel Gibson and Michelle Pfeiffer and uh, Kim Basinger and Glenn Close and other people. And somebody named Tom Cruise as well. So it's a very inexact science, but we'll continue to do it every year. So that's it for our 12th annual Rising Stars show with our picks of six of the hottest, most talented young performers who are going to be an important part of Hollywood's future. Please join us next time when we'll go back to reviewing all the new movies in town. I'm Michael Medved. And I'm Jeffrey Lyon. So until next week on Sneak Previews, don't forget to save us the aisle seats.